much. You're welcome. Okay, welcome everyone to our tutorial. I see there's quite a number already connected. Uh, this is a tutorial given by uh, Michael Muller and myself, Daniel Kremers. We are from uh, the Technical University of Munich and Michael is from the University of Siegen. And this is a tutorial on the model versus learning based approaches to image reconstruction. Uh, we discussed up front with Michael and we decided not to overload you guys with uh, too much uh, stuff. And so we are aiming for roughly one hour tutorial. Um, I think we can take questions in between. So if there's anyone who uh, wants uh, to raise a question in between, that should be no problem. Otherwise, we'll also have ample time for uh, a discussion after at the end of our presentation. We'll do a presentation that is roughly split in half, more or less. Um, uh, I will do the first part and then Michael will do uh, the second part. So let's get right into it. If Again, if there's any questions, any concerns, any technical problems you might have, uh, let us know and we can try to fix things. Okay, so let's get started with a slide that I think many of you may have seen. Uh, we live in the age of deep neural networks. Uh, for the last decades, they've really swept the field of computer vision, which is my area, but also you know, well beyond computer vision, all areas of data analysis. Uh, people are nowadays increasingly deploying neural networks to process data, large amounts of data and to infer information about the world around us from measurement data. And so deep networks have been extremely successful in quite a range of topics. Uh, but everything, at least from my perspective, started uh, around 2012. Admittedly, neural networks have been around forever, uh, um, but um, they kind of resurfaced in 2012. And, they resurfaced, at least from my perspective and from the perspective of the computer vision community, and I think most of the world, on a challenge that was a very classical challenge in computer vision, namely the so-called ImageNet challenge. Uh, this is my colleague, Fei Fei Li, and her team at Stanford. They put out this big data set with millions of images, uh, real world images containing, you know, airplanes, cars, bicycles, etc. And you're supposed to detect what's in each image. Each, each image supposedly contains one type of object. There's many classes, many images. And so on this data set, even humans make mistakes when it comes to really strange classes like physialis or something, you know, objects that you hardly recognize or many people don't actually know what they are. And so, but nevertheless, you know, with all the effort that the vision community had dedicated to the challenge of object detection, object recognition over decades, the best performing method at the time made um, on whatever scale, 26 errors, whereas the average human only made five errors. So clearly the performance of the human was more than you could say five times better than the, the best performing machine learning method. And at, in 2011, people were kind of struggling and didn't know how to improve the performance, how to bridge that gap between human performance and machine performance. Yeah. And then something rather unexpected happened. Uh, then Alex Krzyzewski and collaborators proposed this deep network architecture to process images in, in a, with layered convolutions and nonlinearities. I think you all know these architectures. And uh, you know, in, from one year to the other, they managed to dramatically reduce the error on this big data set from 26 to only 16 and a half. And in the wake of this uh, seminal work of Alex Krzyzewski and collaborators, People further refine the network architectures, uh, refine the types of uh, uh, architectures that are used, the, the types of layers, also the number of layers, things got significantly deeper, all the way to, you know, this is only until 2016, the story obviously keeps going on, but what I wanted to show here is with deep learning, the vision community managed to beat the human, the average human, 
on a challenge that I would argue the human was designed for by evolution, recognizing objects in, its nat in their natural environment. And so, you know, this is something that's often overlooked when you look at the success of machine learning and artificial intelligence. People always celebrate, you know, a computer that can beat humans in playing chess. You know, humans were not made to play chess, but I would argue they were made to recognize objects and images. And so this, for me, is the real breakthrough of, of machine learning to beat the human uh, on a challenge that they were essentially designed to perform well on. Um, that was object recognition and the next, in, to, at least to me, it came a bit as a surprise that this not only solves the problem of object recognition, such high level vision tasks, but also a lot of low level vision tasks can be tackled and solved very uh, well with deep learning. For example, 2015, we published uh, one of the first approaches to do optical flow estimation with a neural network technique called FlowNet, uh, surprisingly. Um, and it basically, it, it just takes two uh, consecutive images and the ground truth flow field and then trains a deep network to predict from two images the corresponding flow field. And you know, if you have enough training data, this works impressively well and actually does outperform the state of the art. And so today, the best performing optical flow methods are all deep learning based. And similarly, other low level challenges, this for example, is a, the team of Roberto Cipolla, who showed that you can do semantic image segmentation with deep neural networks. And I think one of the reasons that they perform so well is that in, in you know, classical inverse problems approaches, we'll come to that, they typically have a data term and a regularizer. And basically, deep networks with their nested convolutions excel at you know, creating amazing data terms that can tell you very precisely for every pixel, which class of objects it is. And as a result, you don't really need as much of a regularizer anymore. And here as well, you know, we can do videos, uh, object segmentation in videos and note how pixel accurate the segmentations are. And this, for example, was trained on just one of the images of this sequence and can then track this uh, kite surfer over the whole sequence extremely reliably. At a level of, I would say, precision where classical methods would not have been able to do this. Moreover, we can uh, tackle other problems, for example, the reconstruction of the world from moving cameras, a problem often called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping with deep networks. And uh, for the sake of this tutorial, I want to go a little bit deeper into this approach, but here's an overview of its performance. This is an approach that can track a single monocular camera, so just one gray value camera, at unprecedented levels of precision, much better than previous ones. And the way it works is this is actually not a pure deep learning approach, but a hybrid technique. So it, what, what you can do is when you have two consecutive images, you can uh, train a network to actually just from one image predict the depths. And so for every pixel uh, in the image, it predicts the depths using training data. So the assumption is obviously that the world you drive through is to some extent familiar. And these predictions, interestingly, they are metric. So they actually tell you in meters how far the things are, which implies that if you can feed that prediction into a SLAM approach, you get reconstructions that are absolute scale. So you actually also reconstruct the scale, something that traditional monocular approaches cannot do because as you know, you know there's this scale ambiguity in, in monocular reconstructions. You never know if you moved one meter and the world is one meter away, or if you move two meters and the world is two meters away, you get the same imagery. And so for generations of students, I've taught in my classes that you cannot recover the scale of the world from a single moving camera. Well, that turns out was a lie. You can if you know the world you go through and the deep network can learn that as well, along with the depths. But beyond predicting the depths, you can also, given two consecutive images, predict the relative pose of the camera, that camera transformation, rotation and translation from one image into the other. 
And you can even go further and say you can predict uh, what's called an aleatoric uncertainty. It basically tells you, you know, typically in SLAM, traditional SLAM, you would try to align based on brightness consistency. Now that often works, but many times it fails. For example, if you have, you know, metallic structures like the cars on the right, or, or you know, translucent structures like windows, etc., or if you have occluding boundaries at, at object boundaries, uh, then brightness consistency will be violated. It turns out we can actually train a network to predict which locations are the ones where brightness consistency is likely not fulfilled. And then we can correct that and downweight these in a classical SLAM approach. And so we can integrate all these predictions into one loss function for SLAM. So we add terms in the loss function to enhance the classical energy minimization based SLAM by saying the reconstruction should be as consistent as possible with all these depths, pose, and uncertainty predictions. And with that, we get a, a monocular odometry approach that is completely unparalleled in terms of its performance. What you see here is already a hybrid, a technique that kind of integrates ideally the best of both worlds, deep learning and energy minimization. And this is what this tutorial is about, to look a little bit more into, you know, are there ways to combine the advantages of both of these approaches? But before we do that uh, in more detail now, let's look at a little bit why there may be a potential. As I showed you, you know, not just for high level vision recognition, image classification, but also low level vision, denoising, segmentation, deblurring, super resolution, stereo, optical flow, camera based localization, mapping for all of these approaches. Today, the leading methods all involve some form of deep neural network. And that obviously raises the question, are the classical approaches, energy minimization methods to solving these types of problems, are they all completely outdated? Should we give up what we've done before and start from scratch? And I must admit, when you look into the vision community over the last years, it does look a little bit like people are doing that. They completely forget what they did before and, you know, take an AlexNet and train end-to-end -end and get great performance. And, you know, this is not uncommon that the scientific community tends to have a short memory. But still, you know, I, I think there is aspects of classical methods that may be very powerful and help to improve the shortcomings of neural networks. And they do have shortcomings, and I think many of these are well known in the community. First of all, as you all know, typically networks do not provide this separation of likelihood and prior, we'll come to that in a second, that classical energy minimization approaches uh, have. Typically, they require huge amounts of labeled ground truth training data to get them working. There is now increasingly so-called self-supervised approaches, but at least you know the, the, the off-the-shelf deep network assumes that you have ground truth, which is in many applications, say in medical, very hard to get because you cannot pay you know millions, uh, you know, to, you cannot pay doctors to label millions of, of images to get the ground truth. In addition, uh, and this is kind of related to the previous uh, problem, uh, they do not generalize well beyond the trained task. And we'll come to that in a second because this is quite a dramatic shortcoming of traditional neural networks. And it's related to the fact that they don't separate likelihood and prior. They learn the entire task, whereas sometimes you want to split and you want to learn something just about the world. I'll come to that in a second. And uh, lastly, a well-known problem for anyone working in this field, they're very slow to train. And so we need powerful GPUs. We need hours and days to train larger networks. And so the question arises, can concepts from energy minimization methods help to resolve these shortcomings? And let's look into one of the most prominent shortcomings, this lack of generalization. And you know, generalization was always a strong aspect in learning ever since people talked about, you know, learning from examples, you know, how many examples do you need to learn something? And I think one of the biggest 
uh, capacities of the human system is to learn from very few examples and amazingly few examples, often just one example. When I look at my kids, for example, often just one example is enough for them to understand. Um, whereas with uh, deep learning, we are, seem to be going the opposite direction and often need millions of supervised uh, data. Here's an example to show that a little bit more. We trained a neural network for, to denoise images, and we trained it with uh, uh, images that were noisy, uh, so always pairs of noisy, clean image, except the training data was all Gaussian noise. Now, as a human, you'd say, what the hell, you know, I've always said, you know, it doesn't matter what noise you have, noise is noise, right, to remove the noise. The network should learn something about the, the natural image, and if whatever is inconsistent, it should remove, right? That's, and whether this is Gaussian distributed or not, who cares? Well, the network turns out cares. We trained it with Gaussian noise. Here's the image before denoising. Here it is after denoising. This image happens to have salt and pepper noise. I don't know if you see the difference on Zoom, it's hard to see. I'll tell you there is no difference really. <laughs> They're practically identical. It creates a little bit of blurring, but one thing that doesn't happen is none of the noise pixels seem to vanish. They all remain pretty much fixed and unchanged. And so, you know, a denoising approach that removes the signal but not the noise is, you would argue, not very useful. Um, so this is a clear lack of generalization. If I train with one noise model, it doesn't work with a different noise model. Even if you change the sigma of the Gaussian noise, already the performance dramatically degrades. So, so this generalization is even within a class of noise models, extremely limited. And so let's look at how classical approaches would have tackled such a problem. Classical, you know, model, we call them model-based approaches here. They start with a model of the image formation process, the process of how the observed data comes from the true state. So the observed data we call F as usual, the true state we call U, and then typically there's either a linear or nonlinear operator, let's call it A, and then there's some noise, let's say additive Gaussian noise or whatever, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, a classical approach to solve these problems, so to recover from the noisy observation, the true state U, is the so-called maximum a posteriori approach. I'm sure many of you have seen it before. The idea is that you create a posterior distribution, the probability for U given the measurement F, and then you find the configuration U that maximizes this probability. And this is what we call U hat here, the optimal estimate. Uh, now, according to Bayes' uh, formula, we can rephrase that as a product of what's called the likelihood. So the probability for F given U times the prior probability of U divided by P of F. And, and then by convention, typically you would apply the negative logarithm to make the product into a sum of two terms. Since the logarithm is monotonous, this has no effect on the optimization. Uh, and so you can equivalently minimize uh, the negative logarithm. And so you have a sum of two terms here. The P of F term is a constant, so you can safely drop it. Um, and, and this is the classical separation that we get in what's called a data term and a regularizer, right? And so this is this approach. We find uh, an optimal estimate uh, for our, say, denoising problem or whatever inference problem we have, whatever inverse problem we need to solve. Uh, and we have a data fidelity term that is the negative log likelihood and um, a regularizer that is the negative prior. Now, typically, the data term is you know, well understood. It is often based on a physical model for denoising, for example. It assumes that you know your camera, you know what the noise model of your camera is. And this is something in practice that we typically do have access to. Say if we do denoising, we know, you know the typical noise model that our camera brings about. What's often much more tricky is coming up with meaningful regularizers. And in the, in the, in the applied math community for decades, for example, total variation was one of the most 
popular and powerful regular risers. It is quite impressive. It's also convex, as you know, this is important once it comes to minimizing this uh, entire loss function. But uh, I would argue it's somewhat simplistic for denoising, for example, that the only thing that total variation essentially says is that from one point to the next, the brightness or color should not change too much. If that is a sufficiently detailed description for natural images is, is obviously questionable. So uh, in some sense, we do want more powerful regular risers. And if we look at this model-based approach, it has benefits, but it has drawbacks. One benefit I would argue is the separation of data likelihood and prior because it's flexible. It means if I take this whole approach into a new environment with different objects, then all I need is a new regular riser because the camera, the sensor, the noise model is still the same. Or if I have a different noise model, like in the previous example with the giraffe, all I have to do is replace the noise model. I don't have to create a new regular riser. So the regular riser tells me which uh, use are a priori more or less likely, and clearly that doesn't depend on what sensor you use to do the observation. So this separation uh, makes sense in, in many ways. It also, the good thing is that we have a well-studied regularization theory behind uh, these variational uh, approaches, these energy minimization approaches. As I said, the regularizers are often a little bit too simplistic. Um, and another issue is that you only get provably optimal solutions if, if for loss functions where the total loss function is convex. So the, this is generally an important uh, requirement for assuring optimality of solutions. And this is an issue because when you look into the real world, you know, uh, Michael will come back to that later, possibly convexity for the regular riser is not necessarily a realistic uh, assumption. We want regular risers that have low cost for natural images and high cost for not natural images. But if you have two natural images, Michael will talk about it later, then possibly the convex combination of the two does not look like a natural image. Still, if you assume convexity, it's even at least as likely, if not more likely, based on a convex regularizer. So this indicates that possibly suitable regularizers for real world data are not convex. And then the whole issue of uh, tr computing a minimizer is tricky. So then you have all these you know, algorithmic challenges of how do you actually solve this problem. So now the question arises, I've se we've seen the benefits and shortcomings of deep learning approaches. We've seen the benefits and shortcomings of model-based approaches. Can we combine the two? Um, and you know, the idea of, uh, and, and, and if, you know, as I mentioned, what you really want to do, the main shortcoming is the regularizer. It's too simplistic. It doesn't really capture the real world. The idea, you know, and, and, and one of the most powerful ideas that deep learning uses is this idea of learning from examples. One should be clear here, this idea of learning from examples is not new. So, you know, deep learning is pursuing that, but there, you know, it's been a very classical idea for, for many decades. The Bayesian framework was there. People knew that the regular riser is related to a prior probability and that this prior can be learned from examples. I'll show you one example. I hope you can see this is a video. It's just one image. Probably you, all you see is noise. But once I run this video now, you might see it with some effort that there is a person walking through the snow here. It's not so easy to see, so I'll run it a couple of times. Uh, maybe I'll even mark, so for those who don't see well on Zoom here, there's the person walking, right? It's barely visible for a human. So, you know, I explicitly designed this to be difficult. I took a, an original sequence and I just corrupted it with a very heavy noise. I think 90% of the pixels just have a random intensity. And so it's very hard to see anything. The question is, can we still segment these types of videos? Can we track a person uh, if we know, let's say, that there is a person? 
And this is what we do here. So we start with a, a training video of a walking person. So I recorded a video of a friend of mine walking, extracted the silhouettes. And now the question is, how can we use that training uh, data? It's not a lot of data, you know, not millions of uh, ground truth segmentations, but just a dozen, let's say. But how can we use these training silhouettes to, uh, to stabilize uh, or to create a prior for segmentation and you know, tracking? And so here's how this works. First of all, the question is how do you represent silhouettes uh, and shape in general? One of the most powerful uh, representations are so-called sign distance functions or level set functions. Here you see one such level set function. Now the space of level set functions is extremely high dimensional. So this is an embedding function where you say the curve that I want to represent is the zero level of this embedding function. The benefit, one of the benefits of this is you don't have a parameterization dependency. And the second benefit is uh, that you um, can model topological changes of the curve. Don't wanna go too much into detail here. This is, um, uh, already, as you can see, roughly 15 years old work. The first thing we do here is we compress uh, in order to, to reduce the dimension of the problem to make the inference more efficient. We reduce to a couple of eigenmodes. So we represent each embedding function phi at time t. So this encodes the silhouette at time t. We, we approximate it with a linear combination uh, of eigenmodes. Uh, so we have a mean embedding function then a set of eigenmodes, typically so you say 10 or 20 eigenmodes to get a fairly decent approximation of the shape. Next, uh, we want to model the temporal evolution of shape. And so we use these shape vector coefficients that is vector encoding the embedding function at time t. And we assume a so-called autoregressive model. We assume that basically the shape vector at time t, these 20 coefficients representing the embedding function at time t, can be approximated as an affine combination of the previous shape vectors at times t minus 1, t minus 2, all the way to t minus k, where k is the order of this autoregressive model. And then to make it a stochastic model, we assume Gaussian noise. Uh, here, additive Gaussian noise. And so in fact, this is called an autoregressive model and you can actually sample from this model. What you see on the top right now is a, a video where I synthesized embedding functions, right, from this model. I just sample from this a model, like, you know, adding Gaussian noise and always creating this linear combination. And what you should see is you, you know, when I did this first, I created this wobbly surface and Admittedly, that's the point when I put it all in the trash can and went home, but uh, the next day I came back and looked at the zero level and realized, oh, there is actually something encoded in here. It does look like a walking person to some extent. And so this is, in fact, related to a probabilistic model. It's, a, it's essentially a Gaussian distribution for each shape vector at time t that is centered around the prediction of this uh, autoregressive model. Right, so at each time, given the past silhouettes, I can create a prediction with this autoregressive model, and then I have a Gaussian distribution here centered around it. Yes, uh, and so we can use that as a prior for map inference. We can say, find the most likely shape vector alpha t given the image at time t, so this noisy sequence that you saw, and given the previously estimated shape vectors for times one through t minus one. And then again, according to the Bayesian formula, this is p of i of t given alpha t times p of alpha t given the previous shape vectors under uh, some mild assumptions. Um, and so what you can use, you can now use this stochastic, uh, you know, it's a dynamical shape prior, if you will, here in the inference as the, you know, the, the prior. And then the likelihood is nicely separated uh, here. And, and with that, we can actually indeed take sequences like that, even more difficult ones where we add occlusions, complete occlusions, and as you can see in this video, 
we can track this walking person through very heavy snow and full occlusions. And in fact, if I stop the video halfway through, for example, here, you hardly see anything, right? The, 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 the silhouette that you're looking for is completely covered. It's not even there. But based on the prior, the algorithm can essentially fill in the missing information. And so this is one example how you can learn priors. Now we come back to the more general setting, how, how to do that more systematically for solving these types of optimization problems. So we have an optimization problem with a data term that depends on the data F, H, we call it, and a regularizer R. Once you have this type of model, there are many algorithms, as many of you know, how to minimize these different splitting techniques, different algorithms, ADM, M, primal, dual, etc. Now, if you use a so-called forward-backward splitting approach, uh, you can solve this problem with the following iterative method where you do basically a gradient descent with respect to the data term here and then the regularizer is enforced with a prox operator which is something it, it generalizes the projection uh, on you know if r was the indicator function of a convex set uh, then this would be nothing but a projection on that convex set and in the more general case this is called uh, uh, the prox operator and as you can see for those who don't know the prox operator it's fairly simple it essentially says given the current estimate v find a u that is on one hand minimizes the regularizer but on the other hand is not too far from v in this uh, quadratic sense so that's the idea of the prox operator and so the prox operator iteratively kind of enforces the prior here right in this classical uh, uh, iterative optimization scheme. Now what we can do, and this is what we proposed in, in 2017, we can replace that prox operator by a neural network that is trained on denoising. Uh, so we have a denoising network trained with Gaussian noise um, uh, with a fixed sigma. And then we can replace this prox operator in this iterative scheme with, as you can see, this uh, neural network. And so rather than having the prox enforce similarity measured in the prior, we have a neural network that enforces similarity based on training data. And so that allows us to to, as you can see, not apply the neural network end to end for the whole problem, but only to replace the regularizer. And we believe that's a meaningful way to solve problems. Why? Because the regularizer is the, the, the ob object that should encode knowledge about the world. The regularizer should tell you which configurations are more or less likely in the real world. Whereas the data term, that depends on how you measure that real world, right? And, and so depending on how we measure it, we would use different data terms, but the knowledge about the world should not be affected by our measurement device. And so that is the aspect that can be learned from examples. What is the benefit? The benefit is obviously that we can apply the exact same network with very different data terms. So, once we have a new data term, a new uh, uh, image formation model, uh, then we don't have to retrain the neural network. We can just apply the same one again. This is, so the insight is really that uh, we just need an operation that makes the current estimate more likely, you know, based on training data. And obviously this insight, it doesn't have to be a forward backward splitting. As I said, it could be primal dual, it could be ADMM or whatever your preferred, you know, half quadratic splitting or whatever kinds of iterative algorithms you prefer. And in fact, this idea has been around. Uh, um, this is, a, you know, a subset of related works in this, in the course of the tutorial, we also want to show you a little bit what people have done in this field. Um, the first two are not deep learning based, but they have this notion of plug and play priors. Uh, I, I think the, the plug and play one, um, I think it uses non-local means uh, as a prior. Uh, Flex ISP, I believe, was using BM3D as a prior. The first deep learning ones, to our knowledge, uh, uh, surfaced in 2017. Uh, for example, these three here. 
Uh, a particularly interesting one is this work Red, uh, Regularization by Denoising uh, by uh, Romano, Ilad, Milan, Farr. They go a little bit further in the theoretical study of this. They actually prove convergence of this iterative scheme. As you know, these uh, a lot of iterative schemes in the classical approach, you can prove convergence. But the question is, if you then replace the prox by a neural network, can you still assure convergence? And uh, basically what they do is they show that under a set of assumptions on the neural network, the algorithm still converges. And these assumptions are essentially assumptions of homogeneity and uh, some non-expansive or contractive property of the neural network. The idea that if you apply it multiple times, it, you know, it, it basically, you know, either contracts or it doesn't, at least doesn't expand. And once you have these assumptions, then uh, they prove that the algorithm converges. So the proofs are essentially related to proofs that, you know, the similar assumptions that you make for prox operators or projection uh, methods. Uh, one of the shortcomings I would say is, you know, there is still an important gap between practice and theory in the sense that the assumptions necessary for proving convergence are to our experience not really fulfilled by typical deep networks. And so, you know, although there is a proof, you know, it's not so easy to make sure that assumptions are actually fulfilled. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, maybe one last comment. Uh, uh, the last paper I cite here is an overview or a review paper by Michael and myself uh, appeared in a book chapter in 2018. It's called Denoising Old and New. And uh, this may be interesting for you. This gives a kind of a more complete overview of you know, all the types of iterative algorithms you can use and how you can replace, the, you know, how you can insert the neural network in these various iterative uh, um, optimization methods. So here's an application of the algorithm I just showed. We train on Gaussian noise and, you know, we take a salt and pepper noise image. As I said, if you just train a network on denoising Gaussian images and you apply it directly, then, you know, the noise is not really removed. There is almost no difference here. But if you then uh, use the exact same network, but uh, as a prox operator with an L1 data term, you see that all the noise is almost perfectly removed. And so this shows you the potential of, you know, not replacing the whole approach with the network, but only replacing the prior and keeping the data term. And there you can model your noise model, you can model your, your image formation process, the linear operator. And so this, this is much better. In fact, uh, here's a quantitative evaluation compared to a, a number of then state-of-the-art de denoising methods like NL means, and, uh, BM3D, etc. And we do uh, significantly outperform these on different noise levels. So this is interesting. The network was trained on uh, 0 0.02 uh, standard deviation, but as you see, it still applies to much more significant noise without any retraining. Uh, you can also apply the exact same uh, denoising network for doing other inverse problems. For example, image demosaicing. Uh, here is a quantitative comparison. So there you actually model the image formation process of image de for image demosaicing. And here, this is maybe interesting to observe. If you train a deep network directly on the image demosaicing task, you do get, as you can see, somewhat better performance, 39.5 here over 37.1. But uh, if you just use the off-the-shelf denoising network, you still you know, get, uh, at least you outperform the state of the art. Uh, so you can't really, you know, you still get slightly better when you train on the whole challenge. So there is still a bit of a gap, but uh, I would argue there is quite a promise in just using the same network for many different tasks. The major benefit is you don't have to retrain for every task. 
So for example, if you want to do motion deblurring, let's say here's the original on the left, the blurred image on the second, and here you see the deblurring result from different methods. And here again, uh, the, the deep network trained on just Gaussian denoising can be applied directly for image deblurring and it does perform quite well. So to summarize this first half of our tutorial, we, sh we see that we can devise hybrid methods that combine the advantages of deep learning, this predictive power of deep learning to learn from examples with the flexibility uh, of a classical, uh, say, model-based or energy minimization-based approaches. And essentially the idea is that we replace the regularizer or the prox step in energy minimization methods by a deep neural network. And as I said, this can be done in many variants and many iterative schemes. I've shown one, I think Michael will go much more systematically into how this can be done in the next half. And what we saw is that uh, the resulting approach generalizes a network trained on one task to quite a multitude of other tasks without having to retrain. And so, as you can see, that brings about this benefit, the flexibility, this generalization uh, power to new challenges uh, without having to retrain the network. So that's all from the first half. Um, I don't know, Michael, do you want to go right out or should we take some questions? What should we do? Um, as you like. So there, the, the way to ask questions, I don't know if everyone has seen this, is through a question and answer section in Zoom. Um, currently, there are no open questions, but definitely feel free to, to use this. Um, I don't know, as long as, as we don't have questions in there, I would suggest I, I continue. Very good. I hand over to you and you share your screen. Okay. Then I will share my screen and start the presentation. Can you all, s well, I yes. guess I can only ask Daniel. You can see my screen now? I can see it. I know it already, but. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, okay. Then also, hello from my side. Uh, ah, now it's hidden again. Let me see if I can get up. Okay, I don't see the, the questions and answers right now. Uh, Daniel, maybe you can interrupt if you see any questions in the Q&A section. Okay, it's, it's down there in, in Zoom. Okay, so um, you, so far, you have seen three different specific examples for uh, hybrid methods between the learning-based world and the model-based world. Uh, the first one was based on incorporating network predictions into a cost function. The second one was based on explicitly um, generating a regularizer, but based on data, and then still solving a minimization problem. And the last one was constructing an algorithmic scheme that still mimics or behaves like a regularization. So in the remainder of this tutorial, uh, I will try to um, kind of give an overview of different conceptual classes for combining uh, learning-based and model-based approaches. So of course, this is a quite uh, active and exciting field of research. So as a little heads up disclaimer, my overview is surely incomplete, but I thought it would be useful to kind of point out different classes of combinations of these two worlds. So this overall house of hybrid methods where we have the classical model-based approach on the one hand, um, considering arguments that minimize the sum of a data fidelity term and a regularizer. And on the other hand, the feed forward networks, I will usually call these networks N, um, that depend on some parameters theta. And the way they work is just by a feed forward prediction. So you feed the data into the network and what you get out is immediately the result to your reconstruction problem. 
of course, provided that the network has previously been trained on many examples of this specific problem you're trying to solve. For this uh, building of hybrid methods, I will talk about four different classes of methods. The first one, maybe the most natural one after the discussion we had in the first half, is based on learning the regularizer. So as Daniel already discussed, the data fidelity term can often be modeled. This um, probability of how a realistic image looks like is much harder to model. Um, and this is why it definitely makes sense to uh, utilize learning-based approaches for exactly this second term, and this will be our first class. The second class will then address this problem of, well, either we learn a convex regularizer and have all the theory, but then maybe we are limited in the expressiveness of this regularizer, or we learn something non-convex, but then we have all issues with uh, being uh, with having difficulties to determine global optimizers. So this motivates going to a second class that is strictly more general of learning the entire energy. After this, we will consider a related class um, that I would call network architectures inspired by optimization algorithms. So basically the idea to roll out your favorite optimization algorithm of a model-based based approach declare certain variables to be learnable and then uh, learn well this unrolled algorithm as a certain architecture of a neural network and then finally i will close the loop and return to the type of method uh, daniel just ended with so integrating networks into algorithmic schemes for energy minimization as we have just seen for example by replacing the proximal operator by a neural network so let's start with the first class. As we have seen, uh, typical energy minimization methods consist of the sum of two terms, data fidelity and regularization. And as a reminder, I put there again, the motivation for these two terms coming from MAP estimates. So one is related to the negative logarithm of the probability that we observe the data F provided that we know U is the true solution. And the other one is without any data corresponding just to the negative logarithm of the probability of you being a natural image. And of course, this is the difficult part and gives rise to the idea of not modeling this, but learning this from data. The way these learned regularizers work in a nutshell is actually quite simple. We would say that we just replace R of U by some parameterized version that not only takes u as an input, but also depends on parameters theta that determine the shape or the way this R of u evaluates. And then we try to determine these parameters theta from suitable data. Maybe as, as an example to make this a little more concrete, maybe you like your total variation prior, so some in a discrete setting a filter that computes differences in x and y direction and then penalizes the one norm of this and you say you like the overall structure but maybe these plain differences in x and y direction are not optimal for your application so you model a parameterized regularizer as penalizing the one norm of some filter kernels that are now encoded here in theta convolved with your input u and penalize the one norm. And now instead of fixing theta to encode these finite differences, you say, I want to learn the optimal filter for my specific application. Doing this conceptually would naturally lead to something we call a bi-level optimization problem. So let's look at the right-hand side first, which we typically call the lower level problem in bi-level optimization. So how would I determine suitable parameters theta that give me the optimal regularizer? I would say for a fixed set of parameters theta, I can compute the argument that minimizes my energy because this is the way how I will finally determine my solutions. This argument that minimizes the energy now, of course, changes as I vary theta, which is why I can view this as 
a function UI of theta. So for a different theta, I get different UI of theta. And now I have an upper level problem in which I actually determine the parameters theta by comparing my UI of theta to the desired ground truth on a set of examples. So this is the typical strategy of bi-level optimization problems, and they are quite challenging to solve, but there have been several different approaches on how to do this. The first class of method for solving these bi-level optimization problems is unrolling, where I just say I approximate my argument that minimizes the lower level problem by a fixed number, say n steps of my favorite alg optimization algorithm, say n steps of gradient descent or some other algorithm, and then replace this ui of theta by these n steps. Now doing n steps basically means concatenating n different um, functions, so to speak. So my overall ui of theta is a deep concatenation of different functions. And of course, these days, uh, computing gradients through this concatenation of several functions has become quite easy because frameworks in machine learning like TensorFlow or PyTorch, of course, allow you to do this automatically. So this is one approach and I'm always giving you some exemplary references of techniques that have used these uh, strategies uh, very successfully. A different way that is maybe the first, yeah, systematic, very systematic mathematical approach would be by going through implicit differentiation. So if I'm calling the entire cost function of my lower level problem, uh, my energy E that depends now on you, my exemplary data Fi and theta, then of course stating that Ui of theta is an argument that minimizes this energy has as a necessary condition the fact that the gradient of the energy with respect to u evaluated at the point that uh, is supposed to be the minimizer is equal to zero. Now, this implicitly characterizes the function ui of theta, and there is this nice theorem called implicit function theorem that tells us about this function ui of theta as well as its derivative with respect to theta. The problem of applying this implicit function theorem is that you need to differentiate. So for computing the, dif um, the gradient with respect to ui of theta, um, with respect to C theta, sorry, you need to differentiate this gradient of the energy once more and invert it. So you need to invert the Hessian of the energy and think of, thinking about usual image processing problems, um, the Hessian is of course very, very high dimensional and it's very tough to actually compute or even uh, invert it. Yet there are some uh, approximations or lower dimensional problems for which this works quite uh, successfully as I've listed here. Finally, one idea could also be to replace this difficult to solve bi-level optimization problem by something that is easier to solve so optimizing a surrogate objective. So for instance, I could just say, I want to find an energy here in such a way that the gradient of the energy at my optimal points UI star is zero. So ideally it's zero for all my UI star, um, but maybe I cannot accomplish really zero. So I'm just saying the gradient should be small. So I'm trying to minimize for theta just the norm of the gradient of my energy. Now evaluate it not at UI of theta, but at the ground truth. And of course, this is then much simpler, is a single level optimization problem and can serve as an approximation for this. This is actually the motivation for a more complex and more faithful set of functions to approximate bi-level optimization, uh, which we have recently presented at ICCV. So in case you want to get a more thorough overview of uh, optimizing surrogate objective, uh, this is maybe a good reference for you where we also draw some connections to much earlier works um, using support vector machines with learning techniques like max margin methods. 
So overall, these bi-level optimization methods are nice in the sense of you remain in a mathematically sound framework of energy minimization methods. You end up with a regularizer that you have learned from data. And if this regularizer is convex, um, you have all your nice theory. And really, it should be convex. Otherwise, this becomes extremely difficult because I'm writing here is equal to the arc min, but really if the energy here is non-convex, then determining the global minimizer even becomes very, very challenging often. So as a um, maybe okay smiley, I put here it requires pairs of ground truth data, uh, sorry, ground truth so solution and data. So although we are still in the framework of separating the data fidelity term that is not parameterized from the regularizer that is parameterized, it is still the question that since you do train your regularizer within the entire method that includes the data fidelity term, is it really a regularizer that is flexible enough to be transferred to different kinds of applications? And lastly, this is a quite challenging problem um, to solve, especially for non-convex R. And we will discuss a little later why um, non-convex R to some extent seem to be crucial to get really, really realistic regularizers. So due to these difficulties, specifically the difficulty to solve such a bi-level optimization problem, I will now turn to a different version of learning the regularizers that I would call modeling the set of realistic images. So in these type of approaches, you also parameterize your regularizer, but then you just say that your regularizer evaluated at a set of nice example images should be small. So really you try to determine parameters theta in such a way that for all your exemplary nice images, the regularizer should be small. One thing you might immediately realize now is that this requires some modeling to avoid a collapse or something meaningless because just saying the regularizer should be small at specific points, if you don't restrict the appearance of your regularizer enough, it could just choose to be entirely zero or constant because that would, assuming you constrain your regularizer to be non-negative, of course, R being constant zero is a solution to this minimization problem. But now you have to model your R in such a way that this collapse is avoided by design. So this sounds complicated, but I'm sure you're familiar with some of these techniques. Um, for instance, dictionary learning is a very popular instance of what I would call modeling this set of realistic images. Namely, I would say my value of the regularization that is now parameterized by theta is the number of non-zero coefficients in a coefficient vector alpha that I need to represent my u that I'm feeding into the regularizer as a linear combination of dictionary atoms that I'm writing in theta. And now I'm trying to determine these dictionary atoms theta in such a way that natural images can be represented in a sparse way. So have a low value of the zero norm of alpha. So KSVD is probably the most uh, famous and popular algorithm for solving these kind of dictionary learning problems. Yet with the rise of deep neural networks, there are also newer techniques that fit into the frame, same framework uh, that are based on generative models or sometimes also referred to as optimization in latent space, which could be recovered as saying, I'm modeling my regularizer as being the indicator function for being in the range of a suitable network. So, my image must be an output of something that can come out of a neural network that I trained. And maybe the most common uh, way to then design this network is by what's called an autoencoder. 
So something, a, a network where you try to feed some realistic image in, try to optimize all weights in such a way that you also put out the same image that you put in, but you don't make it easy for the network by uh, introducing a bottleneck here um, where really the network has to decrease the number of parameters significantly. And then you typically call the first half that reduces the size an encoder, the second half that reconstructs from this code that is also called an element of the latent space, a decoder and model your overall network architecture as applying the decoder to the encoder to the image. Now, once you use this kind of model, along with a regularization like this, we have a quite interesting effect, namely that typically the encoder that goes from something large to something small is an injective function anyways. And so this constraint of being in the range of the neural network is just dependent on the range of the decoder. So what kind of images can be generated from different codes? And this then allows you to just replace your variable u by the output of a decoder. And you optimize now not anymore for your original image u, but for a latent code. So for an element in latent space um, that is then fed into the decoder. The disadvantage being you have a much more complicated cost function. This is now a deeply nested function. The advantage being your problem becomes much lower dimensional. So this Z typically has a much smaller dimension than the output. So this is why it's called also optimization in latent space. You optimize for this code here. Just to give you also some references for this, this has been, for instance, quite successful in uh, compressed sensing literature. So to sum this idea of modeling the set of realistic images, um, we still remain in this mathematically sound framework of energy minimization where we construct a regularizer. The nice thing is now we are just requiring clean example images UI and not any problem specific data anymore. But of course, as I mentioned before, we still need to do some modeling to avoid a trivial solution or a collapse of R. So you cannot make R arbitrarily uh, expressive because then just saying, uh, I want to have a small value for R leads to trivial solutions. So really, uh, this type of learned regularizers has never seen bad examples. This is surely a difference and maybe something that could make them slightly weaker than fully supervised trained regularizers. In any case, for any of the approaches to learning regularizers, it is clear that these advantages of a mathematically sound framework highly depend on the type of regularization we are parameterizing, namely, if the regularization is still convex in U, we have a lot of nice theory and mathematical properties. But as I will discuss next, I would claim that the most realistic regularizers in the sense of MAP estimates can never be convex. So why would I claim this? Remember that in the framework of MAP estimates, the regularizer measures something like the likelihood of an image. So what does it mean for this likelihood, the probability of this being a realistic image being convex? This would mean if I take one realistic image, say at the beach, and another realistic image, say a cat, and I form a convex combination between the two, I get an image like this, which probably no human would say is a very realistic image. However, now the, the mathematics of a convex function tell you that the regularizer evaluated at this image and one half times the regularizer evaluated at this image plus one half times the regularizer evaluated at this image still needs to be greater or equal than the regularizer evaluated at this image. So this tells me this image needs to be at least as realistic for this regularizer 
as, well, the worst of these two images. So it has to be at least as realistic as one of these two images. So this means, yeah, we are kind of stuck with designing non-convex regularizers if we want to really mimic a human behavior. Uh, this is already bad averaging two images, but I could of course now take the convex combination of many, many more images and I would still conclude that the outcome needs to be somewhat realistic, but averaging or taking a convex combination of many, many images would likely just result in some gray, blurry image, so not realistic at all from a human perspective. So this would maybe motivate a second class of um, combinations of energy and learning-based methods, namely learning the entire energy. So now my formulation is still a bi-level optimization problem. I'm still comparing the argument that minimizes in energy to my ground truth, but now I'm parameterizing not only the regularizer, but the entire energy. The reason why I believe this resolves parts of my convexity problem is that I could now, of course, again say, in order to have theory, I need E to be convex, but this would be somewhat more okay because I agree, I now needed to assign this image a more realistic value than, for instance, the beach image. But now my choice is data dependent. So this means if my data suggests that the true reconstruction should be a cat, then it's fair to say that this is a more realistic image than the beach. Although this is, of course, not in the set of overall realistic images, it's better than this one if we're trying to reconstruct a cat. So in this sense, optimizing for or learning the entire energy would allow in this reasoning to say, uh, to, to have the requirement of the energy being convex. Now, how could we parameterize a convex function in an expressive way? There is a very um, nice and interesting publication on input convex neural networks by Brandon Amos. Um, and his co-authors uh, who describe how to construct such networks, basically concatenating um, convex non-decreasing functions and adding affine linear functions. And then you can use uh, the theorem that the composition of two non-decreasing uh, convex functions remains convex and adding convex functions uh, remains convex and thereby prove that architectures that have layers that are structured like this uh, leave you with an overall network that is input convex. And for all further references on how to learn the entire energy, I could basically go back to learning the regularizer because of course learning the entire energy is a strictly more general class than learning the regularizer. In fact, it is so general that uh, it might be a little too general. So if you look at the lower level problem here and you make a specific choice of parameterized energy, namely you're considering the square two norm of U minus some network N processing the data F, then the lower level problem has a closed form solution namely your ui of theta is nothing but applying the network n to fi for a fixed parameters theta and then you can return from a bi-level problem to a single level problem which turns out to be plain supervised machine learning without any connection to energy minimization well maybe except for identifying this energy with your network but this is of course not a strong way to utilize any hybrid mechanism to design an energy like this. So in this sense, to sum up, um, these kind of problems are surely at least as powerful as usual feedforward networks, because feedforward networks are a special case of this. Um, but of course, they are not ex as flexible, so definitely lose one of the big advantages of energy minimization methods because now regularization and data fidelity term are not strictly separated anymore and you don't have this um, choice of assembling 
problems by choosing one regularizer and choosing one data fidelity term. And of course, I have to say the specific analysis depends on the specific setting. Of course, this class contains all learned regularizers. This class contains feed forward networks. So it's really hard to state general pros and cons of this approach uh, without detailing what exactly we mean here. Yet another class that I would like to discuss are network architectures inspired by optimization algorithms and they are closely related to solving the aforementioned bi-level problems in an approximate way by rolling out the architecture, uh, sorry, rolling out an algorithm. Namely, if we start with thinking about how to solve an energy minimization problem like this and maybe start with the simplest algorithm there is, namely gradient descent, then my update would look like this, that I'm computing a new estimate from the old estimate by subtracting tau times the gradient of my two terms. Now, I'm just replacing the, uh, or uh, let me start over. Now, the idea is to just parameterize some parts of this iteration by learnable parameters and call the output of n many iterations um, my overall network architecture. So for instance, I'm now replacing my gradient of the regularization by some parameterized nonlinear function, depending on parameters theta k, having an architecture nk, and being applied to my current estimate uk. And then after n iterations, I'm calling this the output of the overall network. I could visualize this now maybe as a network architecture that looks like this starting from some initial point that we are free to choose could be a could be f or something like this some transformation of f um, i'm computing a step into uh, i'm computing the negative gradient of the data fidelity term i'm applying my parameterized first function and then i'm introducing what nowadays would probably be called a skip connection between the input node and the combination of all these outputs. So I'm summing all three uh, aspects here together and then use the result of this summing as an input to the next building block that looks uh, identical again. And I'm doing this n times and this is my output which I can then train in a supervised way. So this uh, type of approach has been very successful in the literature. The nice thing about these approaches is they are often as powerful as feed forward networks and uh, often need fewer parameters than uh, networks that are parameterized oblivious of the knowledge of some data formation process. But of course, again, one loses the flexibility as these methods still depend on a specific problem and don't generalize in this plug and play version. Uh, just to point this out without going into any details, the fact that gradient descent can also be interpreted as a, a discretization of a gradient flow, updates like the one I motivated on the previous slide have also been considered in a more continuous sense. So basically in, in this setting, taking tau to zero and k to infinity such that this uh, UK plus one minus UK over tau becomes something like a time derivative of a time dependent U of T um, connects this field of research to uh, the field of differential equations. And there have been several works that have successfully um, exploited this connection in particular to uh, remove this discrete sense of how many layers does your network have to something much more continuous. Finally, I'm returning now to uh, the type of methods that Daniel ended with. So integrating the networks into algorithmic schemes for energy minimization. As we have seen, we write down, again, our favorite iteration for minimizing the energy and then replace the rough effect of the regularizer, so for instance, the proximal operator of the regularizer, by a network that is trained on generating more realistic images, which now could be a denoiser as we did, or other people have used autoencoders again, some network of this type. 
Now, the nice thing, as we discussed already, is for these uh, networks, we remain as flexible as classical regularization methods, while typically being more powerful than classical regularization methods. But, of course, as Daniel also showed, we don't quite reach the performance of problem-specific networks. And um, as outlined in the discussion of the red paper, the analysis and getting provably convergence guarantees still remained difficult. And I'm now glad to um, at least partially speak in past tense because we uh, recently developed a new approach where we get some provable convergence guarantees uh, with very little restrictions on the network. Uh, just to tease this in one slide, um, we assume we're given an energy E and we try to predict uh, directions DK to move into by applying a network to our current estimate uh, with the knowledge of where the gradient at this estimate is pointing into. And the key idea is now to restrict this DK in such a way that it becomes some kind of descent direction for uh, the energy, meaning that it points into a similar direction as the negative gradient of the energy. Uh, okay, I've written here zero now for the sake of interpretability. Uh, really, we need to have something slightly stronger than zero here, but for getting the idea, I think this is fine. And once we are at the point where we predict a descent direction, we update in a form that a usual descent method would. So move a little bit into the direction of, uh, of the direction the network predicted, and that is a descent direction. And due to this descent direction, we can uh, give certain convergence proofs. Just to illustrate what the benefit would be, for instance, when solving an underdetermined linear equation, here's something simple like the two values you're looking for sum to five. If you use gradient descent on an energy like this, no matter where you start, you will just walk towards your solution space, which is this linear subspace here in red, in an orthogonal manner. Whereas if you use our framework, you may bias the reconstruction uh, based on training examples to yield uh, a more desirable point. So for instance, as indicated here by this flow field, uh, by the arrows, no matter where you start, your algorithm now based on these learned descent directions will take you into the cluster of training examples. So in case you're interested in learning more about the technique, I will uh, not go into too many details now, but just refer you to a further SIAM imaging um, mini symposium on high resolution imagery construction uh, next Tuesday, where I will talk about this method uh, in detail. For now, I would like to conclude our little uh, tutorial here. Um, we have discussed several hybrid methods of examples, uh, including learning the regularizer um, as for shapes, learning the entire energy based on considerations like is convexity of the regularizer really a good idea, uh, talking about network architectures inspired by optimization algorithms and integrating networks into algorithmic schemes um, as one flexible and yet powerful way to um, yeah, try to go towards the best of both worlds. But since we're not quite reaching the performance of end-to-end -end trained networks with these uh, flexible methods, I think this is still a partially open quest to really find the best uh, hybrid method that completely only benefits from the best of both worlds. Thank you, everyone. And we're now happy to answer any questions if uh, there are any. So maybe I can stop my screen sharing so I do see questions again. Yes, there is. there is one question. I can read it out loud. Uh, Dushyant Mira. Uh, for the unrolled algorithms, how computationally and memory 
intensive is the training of these algorithms? Yes. Uh, one second. Um, ah, perfect. Yes. Um, so I would say this, is, this, of course, depends on how many iterations you want to roll out, but usually they are not. So rolling out n iterations is usually in the order of magnitude of uh, rolling uh, of having a usual, say, CNN network with n layers. Uh, if all steps that you're doing in one iteration uh, have some closed form representation. Of course, there are more complex variants like OptNet that show that you can uh, solve a linearly constrained quadratic problem as one layer of the network. These things, of course, become much more computationally demanding. But if it's just like a gradient descent rolled out algorithm, then I would say it's similar to a network rolled out, uh, sorry, similar to a network with an equal number of layers as rolled out computations. Yes, maybe if I can add to that, obviously computational and memory efficiency depends on what you compare to. But uh, for example, one thing you can do, and this is actually quite nice, if you want to do denoising, let's say with total variation regularity, in principle, you can devise an iterative scheme to solve it. And then what you can do is you can just uh, fix the number of iterations in, and then basically each iteration is one layer in your network. Uh, and uh, once you retrain that network, you actually, you can outperform the traditional total variation denoising algorithm in terms of computational efficiency, uh, because basically, the differences in the gradient descent, let's say iterative scheme of classical minimization, all the layers are identical, all the weights are fixed uh, if you interpret it as a network. But if you retrain that with ground truth training data, then each layer can have different weights in a way that you get the optimal denoising in n iterations. Uh, and that way you are provably in some sense better than in iterations of total variation. You do the same thing, but you adapt the weights uh, in a way that you get uh, more efficient denoising with the fixed number of steps. Yeah, I would of course always say it's, it's a trade of shifting a lot of effort into the training for gaining a lot of speed in inference. So the forward pass is then very efficient, more efficient than solving a TV problem. But of course, you spend some time in training. OK, I don't see any further questions. questions. Maybe. Do we still have some questions? I hope you've seen there's a Q&A, yes. Uh, there is a Q and A. Um... Ah, okay. Oh, there's a new one. Yes. For combining, combining the, the two, two frameworks, frameworks model ah. and learning based, uh, is it a good idea to start a variational model and then build learning? Uh... Mm. I'm not perfectly sure if I understand the question. Um, do you mean in, in terms of learning about the two fields or in terms of really method design? So maybe uh, to, to at least give one, one possible answer, um, in terms of method design, yes, I would say uh, it's a good idea to start with one of the two worlds with an approach that works. This is now uh, experience from uh, my research life. So starting from complete scratch and beating state of the art is a very hard uh, task to do. Um, so I would always try to see what is the once you have an idea, what is the closest approach from the literature that is out there and working, reproduce it, and then 
uh, twist this in the sense of your own idea uh, to demonstrate that that it's working well because of course training these networks and really fine-tuning and this is what you need to get state-of-the-art results is uh, a tedious but important task on its own and um, you will not succeed with state-of-the-art results uh, if you don't yeah if you don't spend a lot of time on tuning and so it's a good idea to start with something that works well. So maybe more generally the idea of uh, bringing together the best of both worlds is this can only be done once you really understand what is the best of both of these worlds, right? If you take a classical deep network end-to-end -end learning approach to a problem, it basically means you just infer the right solution based on training data and ultimately you know, you, are, you essentially interpolate the training data uh, in some high dimensional space uh, to get your solution. But what you neglect in a purely deep learning based approach is the knowledge about, uh, about things that you might have. For example, when it comes to denoising, you might know your sensor, you might know the type of noise that it creates, you might know the image formation model, and once you do know that, I do believe it's a good idea to start with that knowledge and, mm -hmm. and somehow build in the learning afterwards. But admittedly, there are different ways to combine uh, learning-based and model-based approaches. So we're not arguing that this is the only way to do it. 